This class is called Heaven. And uh, as uh, the great uh, theologian uh, Kenny Chesney says, uh, everybody wants to go to heaven, just nobody wants to go now. Well, we're hoping that after the end of this, uh, this module of Thrive, this class on heaven, you will be so excited, if you're a Christ follower, about what awaits you when you die, when you breathe your last here on earth. Heaven is a fascinating subject, but it's a subject throughout our culture and other cultures that has been so messed up and so largely ignored, uh, even by many theologians and seminarians who don't spend a lot of time teaching and learning about heaven. We're going to base this study on, largely on the research of probably what is now, at least in our contemporary times, the classic book on heaven. It's called Heaven, and it's by Randy Alcorn. And it's a pretty large book. If you want to pick it up, uh, uh, you're certainly uh, invited to do so. It will amplify on and, dis and give you footnotes and references to much of what Andy and I will be teaching over these next several weeks. This is an excellent book, and uh, if you pick it up in the next week or so, you can jump right in next week. We're not following it chapter by chapter, but it's organized in such a way that as we do a topic here, you'll be able to follow along. Uh, we're doing, this class really runs uh, six weeks, although it's going to meet over seven. We're going to take the Wednesday after Easter off, and our last class will be on April 17th. For those of us here in the auditorium at Troy, uh, you can uh, pick up uh, this class online as well. If you miss a class on Wednesday nights, just wherever you are, tune in to the internet at woodside.com. TV. That's our internet campus, woodside.tv, and there's a link there. You'll click on that. It'll open up on Wednesday nights at 7 right to this, uh, this study that we're doing now. I went backstage a minute ago, and I looked, and it looked like an Apple com commercial here, Andy. They should maybe pay us royalties, so we'll have to cover these up. Uh, w w a couple of quick things about what, some of the ground rules that we want to establish on this class. Uh, first of all, um, we have to agree on a couple of things, because if we were to develop all sorts of points related to this, we would never get through in a six-week study on heaven. So we are assuming two things. One, that you are a Christian. Uh, we will teach this from a Christian viewpoint. In other words, as followers of Christ, uh, we uh, come to agreement as Christians. We believe that there is no other way to be saved but through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is nothing that we do, but it is all through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're here tonight as a skeptic or somebody who's just checking it out, that's great. Um, I think you'll find some fascinating material here, and I think it will cause you to dig deeper into God's Word and what He says, and that's, that's terrific too. But just know that we are uh, not here to defend the Christian faith because, um, well, that's a whole different course. So we're all assuming that we are followers of Christ and we will teach from that viewpoint that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, the only way uh, to heaven is through Jesus Christ. So that's the first uh, assumption. The second one is that the Bible is true, um, that, that the Bible is the final and complete revelation of God and it is the sole authority uh, of all spiritual truth. It's not the teachings of the church or any one person. It is the teachings of the Bible that we use. That is our ultimate authority, and that is the reference point that we will use over and over again. So uh, hopefully you'll understand that. If, if uh, you're not sure on either of those points, uh, that's fine. Just listen and take what you can from the class, but know that that's our assumptions. One, that we're all followers of Christ. We understand there's no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And two, um, the Bible is true, is true. So that's where we go. Now, heaven is an interesting topic, but it's amazing as we did our research on this over the last several months, and as even Randy Alcorn had, the reason he wrote this book, is how little is really taught about heaven and how our culture is so messed up about what heaven really is like. When you open the Bible and you begin to look at heaven and how many times it's referenced and what it's taught about, you'll find a stunning amount of material. And we think even in this class, you're going to be amazed at, at what the Bible teaches us about heaven. 
what heaven is not and what heaven is. But I want to take a quick overview as we walk through this to, to make a point that the notion of heaven, of an afterlife, is ingrained in every human being in every part of the world, from every culture. God has hardwired us uh, through our DNA, so to speak, to understand that this life on earth, in this current existence, is not all there is. There is something else. And every culture believes that. And what I wanted to do today was sort of to, to do a, um, a, an overview on all of that that looks at um, not just uh, what we believe, but so you can kind of put this in other cultures and what they believe and how they believe the afterlife flows. So let me just briefly start with them. Let's start with ancient Egypt. Um, the Egyptians believed very much in the afterlife. That's what the pyramids were really all about. And even uh, from school, we had a rough idea of how important it was to them. But they believed that the, uh, that the, the, the final step in the transition to uh, an afterlife was judgment in something called the Hall of Mat. Uh, that, that's the God of justice to them. And that judgment came from a God named Horus, H-O-R-U-S, Horus, who is the God of the sky. And Toth, T-H-O-T-H, who was uh, sort of the scribe of the dead. And, and as you look at these cultures, you'll see many of them have a book or a scribe or some sort of a record about where you go in the afterlife. Uh, the Egyptians had this um, ritual known as the weighing of the heart. Uh, and they believed that heavy hearts were swallowed by a creature with this uh, crocodile head that was called the devourer of souls. Uh, the good people went to the happy fields where they joined um, Osiris, uh, who was uh, the god of the underworld. And there were many spells and there were many rituals, all of them designed to ensure a favorable judgment and were supposedly written down in this papyrus linen uh, book of the dead. That's a quick overview of the Egyptians, but some common themes there that we will see now picked up culture by culture. The next culture we want to look at is Greece. Now, um, in general, the Greeks feared death. Uh, the journey after death, they believed, was uh, to a, a land known as Hades. Uh, and it was ruled by the god of Hades. Uh, the first part of that journey required that they cross a river uh, called uh, Styx. And then, uh, and that was, when they, that happened, they were buried with a coin for a boatman that they had to pay. The Greeks were given coins when they were buried. Uh, and then um, they had to pass a three-headed guard dog, uh, and that you'd have to appease that with another gift, which was a honey cake. So they buried their dead with coins and honey cakes. And this underworld that the Greeks had involved punishment uh, for the bad and pleasure for those who were good. On the one hand, there was the Elysian Fields, which they described as a very sunny, green paradise. And that was to, to the home of all of those who led a, a, a good life, while others were condemned to a life of torture. That's a quick overview of a very complicated uh, belief system. But again, some common threads there that you can even see some relationships to what the Egyptians believed. Next, I want to look at Rome uh, as we look at, at the three major cultures at the time of Christ and, and the apostles. Now, Rome, uh, they, they, the Romans viewed life as a prison and that, and that we had to sort of serve a term uh, uh, and that we had to be served by uh, the Spirit and then uh, we would be freed uh, to go to take the Spirit's place in the Milky Way. Uh, the Romans had a very involved system too. Life was, uh, and it's complicated, was, was seen as the spirit's death. That the spirit uh, died literally and lived on earth. And it, it had a period of harsh servitude that it had to enact uh, before it died. And the purpose of, of the spirit's life was to nurture the world, to cultivate the physical. And a life uh, that was spent in service and in good deeds... Uh, 
uh, honor for one's family and country, that was seen as a, a sort of a highway to the skies and a, a guarantee of the joy that was to follow. Uh, the mortal wound they saw as the center of a revolving universe, uh, the lowest, in fact, of nine different spheres of which the sun and the moon turned, and the mortal body was viewed as the uh, outer representation of the spirit, uh, and the spirit was the only immortal part of, of mankind, that there was no uh, bodily resurrection. That's from Rome. Now, come across the other side of the world in Polynesia, and uh, you'll find the uh, Maoris of New Zealand, uh, they view death as a journey, another common theme. Um, they had, had vi had viewed it also as crossing a river, complete opposite side of the world. Uh, they saw it again as crossing a river. They had a key hope and an expectation, and that was reunion with family and with friends in the afterlife, family and friends who had gone before. The deceased would be greeted with wailing and chanted to commemorate their arrival. And the path to the other side uh, was a dangerous path. There were monstrous creatures and dangerous cliffs. Uh, but once there, uh, in the era after life, it would be comfortable and it would be familiar. That's in Polynesia. Coming back this way and into the south, the ancient Aztecs. Uh, they believed that uh, they had a lot of similarities to the Polynesian beliefs uh, that I just described. Uh, they had a priest who would deliver a formalized speech over the, the newly dead person, uh, and there would be a ritual that they thought would somehow ease its path to the next level of existence. They trickled water on the head uh, during a baptism. Uh, words of mourning were pronounced. Papers were laid on the corpse, and that was supposed to help you. They had little maps on them to pass through the hazardous journey that they faced. And um, they had this uh, ninefold stream that they had across, another river. You see that common belief? And then they had uh, a hound and a master. And once they passed all this, this, this dog, this hound, and, and the master of that underworld, they'd entered this eternal house of the dead. Uh, and uh, they also sacrificed, by the way, uh, the person, the uh, Aztec's dog at the time of their death because it was that hound that helped them get through their way. Crazy stuff, isn't it? But it goes on. Um, when, you, when you look at, um, the next culture we want to look at is Islam, really active in our time. And I, I'm doing short shrift to these uh, beliefs because we're trying to just quickly and briefly summarize them. There's different strains of belief in Islam and, and in all these other religions we've looked at too, but um, Islam's belief on the afterlife really comes from their holy book, the Quran, and it says that salvation depends on the actions and the attitudes of man. However, repentance can turn an evil man towards the virtue that will save him. Uh, there's a final day of reckoning that they uh, describe in pretty um, uh, pretty stupendous terms and on that day they say every man will account for what he's done and his eternal existence will be determined on that basis. Uh, Muslims recognize that different individuals have been given different abilities and various degrees of insight into the truth and that every man will be judged, every man will be judged according to his situation and those who live according to the truth, uh, to the best of their abilities, will achieve heaven. Uh, infidels, those who are not Muslim, who are presented with the truth of Islam and reject it, will be given no mercy. Uh, they believe, uh, as Christians do, that God judges all men. Uh, they believe that the infidels fall off a bridge into hell while the good men continue on to heaven. And the Quran has all sorts of very vivid descriptions of heaven and hell and Heaven is always described in terms of worldly delights. You've heard, for example, that, that some of the, fund, the uh, radical Islamic terrorists are, are promised a, a, a dozen virgins waiting for them in heaven. And so that's, that's the earthly delights that they describe heaven in. Uh, the torments in hell are in very lurid detail. That's a quick look at Islam's belief in the afterlife. Another religion in our time 
that is getting a, a strong resurgence and lots of cultural interest by popular media in our, our culture is Buddhism. And um, the doctrine of Buddhism is based on the belief that life is basically suffering or dissatisfaction, kind of like the Romans. Remember the Romans, uh, when we summarize that, how they believed that this was, this was really the suffering down here? Well, the Buddhists believe that. Uh, Buddhists believe that um, the origin of suffering lies in craving, uh, desiring things, and so when you die, uh, you don't crave things anymore. And the way to cease craving uh, and to get what they call continual rebirth is by following the Buddhist practice known as um, the, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, original Buddhist teaching um, placed the emphasis on the individual monk working through self-control over, over the desires and the cravings of the spirit. Uh, a series of meditative uh, practices that progressively lose them from seeking self-gratification. The ultimate state for Buddhists is this nirvana, and what that really means is blowing out uh, as like the flame of a candle. That is, nothing can be said about it except it's a permanent state of nothingness with no cravings or nothingness. And the afterworld, uh, they believe, has a physical location uh, lying to the west, somewhere in, near China, on the other side of, uh, of Mount um, Tai. In, uh, it's, a, it's a system that uh, has many different variations, like all of them, but those are kind of the essential teachings of original Buddhism. Now, um, Hinduism uh, in Asia... Uh, they believe that the, uh, the final goal of salvation is escape from this endless round of birth and death and rebirth, this whole idea of reincarnation. Now, it's a, uh, they, their idea of heaven is an eternal resting places uh, on the arms of a, of a loving, personal God, but it usually means that any remnants of personality in that person who has been uh, reborn and reincarnated many different times, that any, any vestiges of personality is in what they call this abyss of Brahman. Um, and they have four different ways of reaching uh, that salvation um, uh, through yoga and uh, the, the way of knowledge, the way of devotion, um, a way of action which strives by performing works without regard for personal gain. And then um, uh, lots of meditative uh, techniques. Most Hindus uh, consider that they have many incarnations ahead of them before they can find final salvation. Uh, although some sects believe that a, a gracious uh, divinity will help them move along faster if they're better here. But basically it is this endless series of incarnations. That's Hinduism. And they uh, believe that they have just a long ways to go in heaven or that eternal state of, uh, of nirvana, uh, in their view, is just far, far away. Judaism. Now, moral behavior and, um, and attitudes, most Jews believe, determine one's eternal existence in whatever the hereafter is. Um, they do not have a, a Christian notion of saving grace in Judaism. Um, but it is taught that God offers even the most evil men the possibility of repentance. And after such repentance, one can atone for their rebellion by doing something good, some positive action. But the notion of individual salvation and heavenly existence is, is not prominent in Judaism. Um, in fact, many Jews Christian, uh, uh, criticize Christianity as a selfish uh, religion that's too concerned with the personal rewards we get in heaven. Um, they don't have a strong notion of an afterlife. It's not well developed in the Old Testament. And uh, later Jewish writers uh, speculated uh, about a final day of judgment, but there wasn't a lot of theology to that. Bottom line is Jews still hope for the coming of the Messiah, who they believe will come as, more, as much as a political figure of power uh, and hand out eternal judgment and reward to all. And then there are some of the um, 
uh, uh, splinter groups that may call themselves Christian or some of the groups that are just outright cults in our time. Um, Jehovah's Witness would be one of those. Uh, these are generally members of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And they believe that hell does not exist. Um, they interpret hell symbolically as the common grave of mankind. Um, most uh, people um, simply cease to exist at death. Uh, and they're annihilated. Uh, they believe that there is a heavenly kingdom and they say it was established in 1914 and they believe a little flock or sometimes it's referred to as an anointed class of about 135,400 people are believed by this group to currently inhabit heaven. Uh, another 8,000 are still alive and uh, will also spend eternity with God at, at a later date. Uh, they believe uh, that the Battle of Armageddon will start sometime very soon. Uh, they, they believe that Jesus under Jehovah's uh, divine rage will execute um, vengeance upon the rest of Christianity, Christian, Christendom and the followers of uh, Babylon the Great which are any other religion other than the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And after the world is purified, uh, they believe that um, uh, a theocracy will exist. It's God's kingdom. Um, it will be established on earth for about a thousand years, a millennial period. Uh, those who survive Armageddon, uh, the other sheep, will live in peace in that newly created uh, utopia. They'll be joined by the worldly dead who are resurrected and after a thousand years Satan and his uh, demon forces will turn against God and be finally destroyed. But in order to be saved, according to the Je Jehovah's Witness, according to their governing body, you have to be baptized as a Jehovah's Witness and then follow this um, tightly prescribed program of works that is laid out by the governing body of the Watchtower Society. Those are Jehovah's Witnesses. Then there's the Mormons, um, the uh, Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They believe that not one but three heavens exist. The highest levels are the celestial kingdom, and that is reserved only for Mormon couples who have been married in a Mormon temple and have thus had their marriage sealed for eternity. Uh, the couples eventually become a god and a goddess and uh, the husband will then be in control of uh, an entire universe. Uh, that's the, the celestial kingdom. There's also a terrestrial kingdom and that's the destination they believe for most uh, individuals. It's for uh, liars, according to their, their literature, liars, sorcerers, and adulterers. Uh, hell exists but they don't believe, uh, they, they don't believe people, very few of them will stay there forever. Most will eventually pass uh, through the terrestrial kingdom, uh, cursed and, uh, and not, not experiencing anything like the Christian idea of heaven. Um, the highest levels is that celestial kingdom, and that is only for Mormon couples. Uh, a Christian group, the Seventh-day Adventist group, uh, has uh, a different uh, belief, uh, slightly different. They believe in the traditional concept of heaven, but they don't believe that hell is a place of eternal punishment with uh, sinners screaming in agony. They view, uh, they view hell as a place where the unsaved will be burned up and reduced to ashes, ashes and then annihilated. Uh, they cite biblical verses to show that uh, an everlasting hell means as long as there's something to burn and that eventually you'll burn up and that uh, our God is a loving God and to portray sinners uh, screaming in agony forever doesn't portray God in such a light. That's a rough, uh, compressed view of the, the teachings of the Adventists. Um, then there's the Roman Catholics. Well, uh, Roman Catholics believe that hell is a location where inmates will be punished without any hope of relief uh, for eternity. And among those who will be punished there will be Satan, uh, the, the demons, the angels who supported him and the persons who've died without having repented of their sins. Uh, sincere confession uh, to a Catholic of, of a mortal sin to an authorized priest and making restitution if required um, leads to absolution of the sin. 
they believe that the priest is, can act in that role and actually forgive that sin uh, on behalf of God. Uh, they believe that it can result in the avoidance of hell and uh, the um, level of punishment in hell will be meted out in accordance with the uh, seriousness of the person's sin. In hell, it's uh, a form of um, uh, isolation from God with some supernatural form of, of fire. Uh, the church teaches that the souls of those who have died in a state of grace uh, suffer for a time of purging that prepares them uh, to enter heaven. Uh, purgatory, that notion of purgatory, and they believe people spend time in purgatory until fully cleansed of, of um, imperfections and that that time can be reduced by uh, friends and family if they offer masses or prayers or other acts of piety or devotion such as sometimes burning candles or giving alms and they believe for babies who die unbaptized they enter heaven uh, after staying in a place called limbo for some time all right we could go on and on but what does the Bible say what does the Bible say about heaven well, it says a whole lot, and we're going to spend the rest of our time kind of looking at that, at what it says and what it doesn't say. But let's just take a quick look at, at what we believe it, it, that it we'll see and learn over these seven weeks. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the Bible teaches that every single human being has an eternal life. The body dies, the soul lives forever. Uh, the big question is where each person will spend eternity and how they'll spend it. Heaven is a glorious location where there is an absence of pain, a disease, depression. It's where people will live in new spiritual bodies and eventually resurrected physical bodies. Um, the Bible uh, speaks of, of heaven as paradise. And, and, and the things we're going to learn are so exciting as we dig into that. The Bible also teaches that that second place we go, if not heaven, is hell. And it's a location where the inmates are punished without any hope of relief for eternity. Uh, and the level of punishment in hell is the same, the Bible teaches, for everyone who's there. It uses words like fire and torment it is a horrendous place. And sadly, the Bible teaches that most of us, most of humankind, will be sent to hell after they die. And I think Andy and I were talking about this earlier, and if we have one hope for this class, is that we will understand and have such a burden for those friends and relatives of ours who will spend an eternity in hell if they don't know Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that only a few and those who have been saved by a personal salvation uh, and saving faith in Jesus Christ will go to heaven. The Bible teaches only Christians go to heaven. Now, I want to preface that by saying you will hear later on about some of the Old Testament saints before Christ uh, and uh, in children, you know, boy, little babies that die. But, but heaven is, is a place primarily for Christians where they go. Um, people who have been saved and make it to heaven are not treated equally. Uh, believers who have done a lot of good deeds uh, will be rewarded more in heaven. The Bible teaches that believers who have led uh, an evil life, uh, though saved and though awful glad to be in heaven, will be rewarded less. Now this class that we teach is not about hell. Maybe that's what we'll do next year. We'll, we'll add one of those if you, if you think that's interesting. This class is about heaven. And while we're going to learn some things about hell as a byproduct of, of, of what the Bible teaches about the afterlife, most of what we're going to focus on is heaven. And you're going to be surprised, I think, by how much the Bible does teach us about heaven. It's not everything we like to know but there's an amazing amount of detail in the 66 books of the Bible. So, to introduce that subject, um, let's uh, take a look at what we believe and what uh, the Bible says as, as uh, 
Andy uh, continues with his time. All right. Well, let me ask you this question. Are you excited to go to heaven? Okay, one person is excited to go to heaven. Let me ask you again, are you excited to go to heaven? Okay, you know, this is one thing that I just want to touch on briefly as we're walking uh, into this study and looking at heaven and trying to understand exactly what it is that we're missing or, or maybe we're looking for or hoping for, especially as we open up God's word and try to to, to just feel out what does heaven look like? Where are we going to be? What is, you know, are, are we going to know people? Are we going to have our pets there? I mean, right, these are the questions that we have. We want to know exactly what this looks like. And, and one of the things we wanted to do, and Mike did a great job, just giving us this broad stroke to say, hey, the world out there believes that there's something more. But the reality is God's word talks about what that, what that looks like and how to find our way there. But I think for us to really get down that path and to figure out where we're going, what it's going to look like, who's going to be there, we need to understand where we're coming from today. You know, Mike uh, pointed to the different cultures and things and what they believe. And, and the, the one thing I wanted to just touch on briefly as we jump into this topic is that our culture in, in the United States of America has a very strong point of view on what heaven is and how you get there. And before we jump into all the the facets of heaven, I kind of want to walk through some of the things that our world tells us today about what heaven looks like and and what really it it should look like to us or what we should expect as we look at this. I want to start off with just a simple story. There was a gentleman who died, and he went to heaven, and he got to the pearly gates, and he walks up to the pearly gates, and St. Peter is standing there. And, and St. Peter, as he comes up, says, hello, welcome. He said, now before I can let you into heaven, we got to go over a couple things, because it's not that easy to get in. So the gentleman stands there with his hands folded, just listening. And St. Peter goes to him, he says, look, you have to have done something in your life worthy of getting into heaven. So he said, I first want to ask you, uh, you know, did you go to church? Were you a religious person? The gentleman looked at him and said, no, no, I wasn't. Peter looked down at his list and said, ooh, that's not good. Okay, all right, so let's go on to the next question. Next question is, did you ever give money to, to the poor? Were, did you ever do anything generous with your, your resources? And the gentleman looked at St. Peter and said, you know what, I didn't. Peter goes, uh-oh. All right, well, uh, let me see what's next. How about this one? Did you ever do anything nice for anybody? Did you help your neighbor? Did you, did you come alongside somebody, maybe help them with a project? And the gentleman looked at him and said, you know what, I really didn't. And St. Peter's just like, I don't know what to do with you, bud. He's like, I'm trying to open the door, you know, trying to find a way, something good that you've done. And, and the gentleman goes, you know what, I, I just remembered something. He said, I, I was walking out of a store, and there was this old lady and all these bikers came around her, and they were trying to rob her. And I walked right into the middle of that group of bikers, and I went to the biggest, baddest-looking dude. And I told him he was a jerk, and I spit in his face. And St. Peter said, now, now we're talking. He's like, he's like, when did this happen? And the guy said, two minutes ago. <laughs> all right, that was my attempt at humor. But you, you know what? In our culture, in our society today, a lot of our, our views on heaven are found in stories, in jokes, television shows, movies, artwork, songs that we hear on the radio. Our culture is teaching us about heaven in all these little little different aspects. And I just wanted to touch on these briefly because the way that our society forms thinking, it actually creeps into the church. It creeps into our thinking as we try to figure out what heaven looks like. And I want to make sure that we, we see the differences. And, and one of the biggest influencing uh, things on our culture today is this idea of postmodernism. In, in our world today, for us to say that Jesus is the only way to heaven, is, that's politically incorrect. How could you say that there's one right answer? How could you say that there's one truth, one reality? In our culture today, it's it's just believed that there's many different paths, there's many different ways that you can get to heaven. Another aspect to our culture that is, is so prevalent 
is this idea of, of entertainment. And, and everything is about entertainment orientation. And everything's about having a life of fun and excitement and doing great things. I was looking at some numbers and some statistics in a book that I was reading. And, and back in the late 1800s, the average work week was about 70 hours. <clears throat> and I think this year, uh, we, we now see that about 30 hours a week is considered full-time and worthy of benefits. Have you guys heard that? Our culture is shifting toward this mode of entertainment and excitement. There's, there's uh, over 1,500 different locations where you can gamble, game, go to resorts, hop on a, a cruise ship. Our culture is all about entertainment. Now, how does that shape our view of heaven? A gentleman wrote a book about heaven, and, and he said that heaven to him, what he saw heaven looking like was just a wonderland. Disney on steroids. Right? That's what he saw heaven as. He's like, when I get there, I'm going to play baseball with Joe DiMaggio. When, when I get there, I'm going to play the piano with Mozart. And, and heaven has become this thing that's all about entertainment, all about fun, all about excitement. That's what our culture teaches us. Just look at the movies. Look at some of the TV shows. Another aspect that, that really taints our culture or, or drives our culture is this idea of anxiety. You know, in the last 10 years, we faced some of the most gravest tragedies. Um, and, and on top of that, we have news, 24-hour news cycles that put these things right before us. And I mean, if you think back to, I'm sure you can remember the day uh, where you were on, on September 11th, 2001. And in the midst of all the tragedy that took place there, the tragedy that took place with Hurricane Katrina, the tragedy that just took place a, a couple months ago in the school shooting, the, the media, our culture is trying to find answers to say, where do these people go when they die? And, and everybody just kind of defaults to, well, of course, they're going to heaven. Because if you're a good person, that's where you're going to go. They did, they did a study, a, a research study, a poll, asking, people how, asking how many people believed in heaven. About 90% of Americans believe in heaven. 77% of all Americans believe that they are headed there. And in our culture today, it's, it's taboo to say anything different. But the reality is, the thing that we have to understand is we come to the Bible, we have to shake off all these cultural things that we've learned. And we have to get back to the things that are true and that are real. Uh, some of the major misconceptions that I, I want to point out is, is the first one is heaven is boring. Have you guys ever seen those toilet paper commercials with the babies in diapers playing a harp on a cloud? Yeah. And it makes you think, I hope it's not like that, right? I mean, you're thinking like, first of all, I don't like playing harp and I don't want to sit around in a diaper, Right? It's like the last thing I want to do. But there's this perception from, from a theological standpoint as the world looks at our view of heaven or, or kind of this creation of heaven that we've made. It's that everybody becomes an angel and plays a harp and nonstop. I wanted, I wanted to read a quote. This was a pretty funny quote that I found in a, a book that I was looking at. This gentleman says, uh, After an hour or so, or, or so of church, I can get distracted and cranky. My eyes glaze, my mind fogs, my belly growls. I find myself fighting back yawns, and I'm the pastor. <laughs> he said, is heaven a church service forever? I mean, wouldn't that be horrible if we just all had to stand there like this in choir robes and sing nonstop? But this is the perception that a lot of people have. And so in our world today, you'll, you'll hear people very flippantly say, I'd rather party in hell than ever go to heaven because of how boring that would be. But that's the misconception. That's a misunderstanding that we have of what heaven really looks like. That's why this class is needed. One of the things that, that I found in the study that I was doing is that in the past decade, the past 10 years, the church has not been teaching about heaven with any regularity, with any consistency, with any vigor to help people understand what life after death is going to look like. But you know what one of the number one topics of discussion is in pop culture? is the afterlife. Look at the movies. Look at the TV shows. It's everywhere. But the problem is, 
It's not being constructed from a biblical view. It's being constructed by creative minds, a culture of, uh, of postmodernism, a culture of dealing with anxiety and trouble in our world and trying to find answers for what is before us and, and what lies ahead. Another study that I was looking at, this really shocked me, is that people were asked, Americans were asked, do you believe your belief system determines whether or not you go to heaven? Only 30% of Americans said that, that their beliefs have to do with you getting into heaven someday. Only 30% of Americans. Here's the problem with that. We, as the church, have to make sure we're communicating clearly about what heaven looks like and how you get there. Because as Mike said, everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. Our culture, our society is communicating on a regular basis with 3D animation and all kinds of effects about what heaven could look like or could be like or what we could be looking forward to someday in this great Disneyland in the sky. But we have to bring people back to the truth and the reality of what Scripture teaches. It's so crucial, so important for us. Uh, another misconception that I think is, uh, you know, that we really have to overcome is this idea that if you're a good person, you go. One of the, one of the verses that I want to just read for you, just, just real quick, in rebuttal to this thought process that all good people are going to go to heaven, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, as he was talking with his disciples and explaining the future and all that was to come. He said, enter by the narrow gate. He said, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. See, it turns this whole thinking of our society and our culture upside down. Jesus himself said this. He said, most, many, the broad way, that leads to destruction. Few, few find the narrow path. Later, Jesus would describe to his disciples exactly what that narrow path would be. When Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, nobody's going to come to the Father except through me. This is a reality that has to be understood. And, and you know what? For us as the church, we cannot sit back and just take this in as our own. You know, I, I heard, I've heard it said that Christians are really excited that they're going to heaven and they secretly, secretly enjoy the fact that they know a whole lot of other people are going to hell. Like we revel in the fact that we know and we look out at other people and kind of go, well, that's your problem. But the reality is we have to be sharing this truth because the culture, the society, the working of the world is telling people the opposite of the truth. And that's why this class is so important to us. One of the, the last thoughts I want to have, and then Mike and I are going to do a little back and forth with some key facts about heaven as we get excited about some of the things we're going to talk about. Randy Alcorn in his book said this, and I thought it was so powerful because, you know, one of the things that, is true of me, and I'm sure it's, it's, it's true of many of you as well, is that, you know, we know that heaven is eternally important, but we live like it doesn't really matter. You know, we, 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 we know inside of our minds, we understand that heaven is eternally important, but we live like it doesn't matter. And this is what Randy Alcorn has to say about our desire and our passion and our vigor and our excitement about where we're going to go someday to be with God. This is, this is the quote. It says, What God made us to desire... And therefore, what we do desire, if we admit it, is exactly what he promises to those who follow Jesus Christ. A resurrected life, in a resurrected body, with a resurrected Christ on a resurrected earth. I'll tell you what, let's jump into a couple facts, if we can, about heaven. What? I'll let you kick us off, Mike. We thought we'd have a little fun with this uh, and uh, do uh, sort of a top ten uh, facts about heaven, and a lot of these are, are quick ones that you, we've sort of touched on tonight, um, but I want to start this before we even do this. I want to just read something else that Alcorn wrote, because uh, as great as heaven is, there's a lot of stuff that isn't in heaven. You know what won't be in heaven? Listen to this. No death, no suffering, no funeral homes, abortion clinics, or psychiatric wards, 
No rape, missing children, or drug rehabilitation centers. No bigotry, no muggings or killings, or worry about depression or economic downturns. No wars, no unemployment, no anguish over failure, no con men, no locks, no death, no mourning, no pain, no boredom, no arthritis, no handicaps, no cancer, no taxes, no bills, no computer crashes, no weeds, no bombs, no drunkenness, no traffic jams and accidents, no septic tank backups, no mental illness, no unwanted emails. But there are some cool things, and Andy is going to tell you the cool things, and then we'll go to our top ten okay. facts. Okay, so some of the cool things are close friends, but no clicks, laughter, but no put-downs, intimacy, but no temptation to immorality, no hidden agendas, no backroom deals, no betrayals. Yeah, so it's a pretty cool place. Now here's a quick top ten, and then we want your questions. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take them live here from the audience, and those of you who happen to be watching on the Internet can... Uh, uh, type on the right-hand side of the screen any question. But the first one is that heaven, and Andy, I, I went backstage, by the way, we looked, and now you can see how it, when we stand around out there and we move, I sat here, I was a really good boy, I sat there, but it, get, it gets blurred on the internet. So I'm going to sit here and not blur. I'll make sure I don't If I go around. like this, it's really hard not to stand up and move around. But I'm just glad I didn't fall down the stairs. Yeah. You know, it's, I don't well, know you, if you guys know I'm pretty clumsy. Could have made it to heaven, maybe? Yeah. A little quicker? It's true. All right, first thing is that heaven is not our default destination. Uh, Andy did a, a study, uh, ran some statistics a minute ago, but uh, the LA Times actually asked everybody, and, and it's amazing what they think. For every American who believes he's going to hell, there are 120 who believe they're going to heaven. It's really probably just the opposite. Uh, because we are sinners, we cannot go into the presence of a holy God. As we accept Christ as our Savior and the salvation that his shed blood brings us, we are assured of heaven. But most people in this world do not have that assurance. Do you? Heaven is not where you're going on your own. You, that's not where we're going. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Most people will not go to heaven. And that's a pretty scary fact. Mm. Well, the next one that we have is that the planet Earth, you know, how does that fit into the scheme of things today? Well, Earth is that in-between heaven and hell. And, and when you think about it, um, the, the reality of where we live today, there's actually a little bit of heaven that we see on earth and the things that happen as the Holy Spirit's working through the church and we see God doing wonderful things in the lives of people and relationships with people. We get a taste of what heaven looks like. But on the flip side, because of the sin and the curse in the world, we also get a glimpse of that brokenness and that the pain and anguish and suffering that is just a taste of what hell could be like. And, and somebody said it like this, for the believer... Planet Earth is the closest we will ever get to hell. For the unbeliever, the planet Earth is the closest anyone that doesn't believe in Christ will ever be to heaven. And we're caught in this moment, in this, in this Earth, and there's a little bit of a taste of both. Our third fact about heaven is that those who are currently in heaven, and it's referred to as the intermediate heaven. In other words, if... Maury Potter, who's a follower of Jesus Christ, dies tonight. Maury will open his eyes immediately in the presence of, of Jesus in this, this uh, intermediate heaven. And the people in the immediate heaven are aware of what is happening here on earth. It's pretty amazing. Um, if, if you uh, think about it, remember, many of you were in our study in Revelation last year. Remember Revelation 6, where it makes it clear how... Uh, the saints in that intermediate heaven can observe what's going on on earth and they're asking Jesus, you know, how long? When will you bring judgment on these sinners down there? Um, the, other, the flip side of that is those in intermediate heaven who, who are aware of what's happening on earth are praying for us. Now, they, they probably don't know every detail. They don't know every thought, but they're generally aware of what's going on down here. And what a comfort that is to know that they're interceding for us and praying for us in this intermediate heaven. 
Well, the, the next fact that we wanted to bring out, and this is one we're going to talk about quite a bit over the next couple weeks, is the earth that we live on today is going to be restored, renewed, redeemed. And, and next week we're going to touch into this a little bit more, but the world that we live in today actually gives us a glimpse of what our eternal state, when we, when we live with God and dwell with God for all of eternity in the new heaven and the new earth, we actually get a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like when we see the, the beautiful sceneries or the, the, sun's, the, the sun dropping behind the, the back of a, a mountain or down into the ocean. And seeing some of the, the, the splendor and glory of God's creation <clears throat> the reality is this earth is going to be recreated and we're going to be spending eternity here on that recreated earth. We're going to talk more about that in the coming weeks. It's pretty, pretty exciting when you stop to, to think about what it will be like. Our fifth fact about heaven, we do not become angels. What? <laughs> we don't. I remember hearing a, a pastor who I really believed in once. I really liked this guy. and One time he, he actually preached about, well... They're an angel now. No, they aren't. Angels are angels, and humans are humans. Um, human beings will, in fact, Scripture tells us, govern angels. We will rule over angels, um, and we'll learn a whole lot. I mean, angels will be there. We'll actually see them. Uh, they're here on earth now, the Bible tells us, helping us as God's messengers doing His, His work. But in heaven, can you imagine that, to be able to talk to this amazing uh, creation of God. These, they're not human, but they're angels and their power and their glory. Can you imagine the stories they'll tell you about the close calls you had and the things that you missed on life? If only you had known what was really at stake, the principalities, the powers that were involved. Mm. We will spend lots of time uh, with uh, uh, our, our angel friends, but we don't become angels when we die nor do little kids become angels when they die. Angels are created. God is not creating any more angels, um, and they're a magnificent creation, and we'll get to know them. That's cool. Well, you know, this, this next fact that we're looking at here, number six, is uh, my, one of my favorites, the fact that we're going to get a resurrected body someday. Can I get an amen? Amen. I'm excited about this fact because I have really been packing on the pounds lately. And, uh, hey, you know what? That means that we could probably do this marathon that uh, the Woodside Runners are doing. That's probably the only way I could do the marathon. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that's really exciting about the promises that are, that are held in Scripture is this promise that just like Jesus rose from the grave, so likewise will we follow and become just like him. Receiving a resurrected body to go on in glory just like our Savior did. Uh, that's an exciting promise. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to that. We're going to talk more about that as well oh, in the coming yeah. weeks. We'll spend a, a, a lot, a lot of time night. on that. Number seven, we will work in heaven. I mean, work was not part of the curse in Genesis 3. I tell Bethany that it was. Are you sure about I'm, that? I'm absolutely sure Every time that. she asks me to take out work the garbage, is not part I'm like, of the I can't wait for If you think of it, one of the first things uh, God did in the garden with Adam is he gave him work to do to, to take dominion over the creation, to care for the animals, to name the animals. We will work. Uh, and, and our creativity, uh, our intellect, uh, all of this is going to grow and find true fulfillment in heaven. Who knows? Many of you know I'm a tech geek, you know, with all of my little tech toys, but can you imagine the technology that we're going to have in heaven? Uh, what new music is going to be composed, the way we'll be able to experience it? Uh, all of this for the glory of God. Uh, Eden and the delights of the Garden of, of Eden perfected, but we'll have meaningful, fulfilling work to do in heaven. It's Pretty exciting. Cool. That's very exciting. And so is this. The, the, uh, the next point, number eight, is we will eat in heaven. All right. This is good stuff. Good. If you remember when Jesus was resurrected, he, and he, he met with many of his disciples between the time when he, he rose from the grave before he ascended into heaven, he sat down and had some food and, and had meals. And there's, there's passages of Scripture that talk about the feast and different things that are going to be taking place in the future and in, in eternity. Um, Boy, I'm looking forward to eating. <laughs> Number nine, um, there will be animals in the new heaven and the new earth. 
Now there are animals we know in the intermediate heaven where we go if we were to die tonight because what well, we know from our study in Re Revelation that there's horses in heaven. Mm -hmm. um, this, is a, this is a bit of a controversy among many in the, in the faith. Um, it's important for us to understand that animals are different than humans just like angels are. Animals don't have souls um, but animals are living beings and just as God created Eden uh, with animals and plants and trees as his perfect garden and just as we have learned a little bit tonight that uh, uh, the, the, the eternal heaven is Eden uh, perfected, restored, it's logical I, I think and Randy Alcorn makes a point in his book to believe that there will be animals in heaven. Um, now as far as our pets, scripture doesn't say whether Fido will be waiting for us as we enter heaven but wouldn't it be just like God mm -hmm. to restore our pets to him? I mean, God loved our, he created them. I mean, he created these animals. And he created this wonderful relationship that we can have with them. They bring us such joy. And so many people believe that in some way or another, our pets, probably not resurrected like us, but in various forms, will also be in heaven. It's one of the delights that we'll find out someday when we get there. Number 10. In fact, number 10, this is, this is one I'm really excited about, that we will know one another in heaven. The idea of, of going into an eternity of unknownness, it just doesn't sound like paradise, does it? But the promise of seeing the ones that we love that have gone on before us. How many of us here have somebody that has gone on before us mm. and is probably waiting for that moment when we take our last breath? That's exciting to think about to be, be reunited with our loved ones who, who also had put their faith and trust in Christ. And, and also, you know, looking forward to seeing one of the things, honestly, I, I can't wait to meet David, King David. I can't wait to meet some of the, the patriarchs and, and the apostles and to talk to them about all the, the things that they had done. We're going to know each other when we get to heaven someday. And I think that makes it even more exciting uh, beyond just the promises of comfort and joy and peace and just that idea that we're going to be together forever. Well, those are our top ten facts, and we can now stand up. Man, that's a long time to sit, isn't it? Well, that's where I got up. I feel sorry I for all you guys. You know, in, in Jesus' days, uh, uh, Jesus sat, and you all had to stand. But uh, we're going to stand. We are running really late, but we want to just take a couple of questions from you. And if there's any questions, and if not, we'll uh, we'll let you go real quick. But any any questions at all about anything you've heard tonight? Back there. Yep. <laughs> well, now, if, if your loved ones are Christians, well, you, you're going to then become like Christ. How do you think Christ would respond to if He didn't have strained relationships. He, he loved everybody. So your relationships will change. The way you look at those that you were in conflict with here will change. And we understand a lot of you have kids to go to, but, but everything changes in heaven and it all becomes good. And so those relationships are restored to the way they should have been here on earth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody else real quick? Let's do two more and then we'll go. Right here. Um, you said that one of the facts was that um, people that are in heaven know what's going on here on earth. But you said in heaven there's no more pain, there's no more... Won't our loved ones be hurt and in pain when they see what goes on here? That's a very good question. It is. Um, they will be very concerned. They will cry out for justice like the saints do in heaven. But because everything is so right with them, that hurt is not the kind of hurt that we would have here. Isn't mm -hmm. that right? Yeah, I believe so. And I think, too, that the, the moment in Scripture where it says that every tear will be wiped from their eyes is actually in the new heaven and the new earth. That's the final one. The Remember, final an heaven. heaven. And we're going to talk about the stages of heaven next week to really understand what's, what's been happening in the program of humanity and where have people gone before Christ, after Christ? Where would we go today? Where will we be after we're resurrected? We're going to talk through some of that. But I think that kind of understanding the program of God and knowing in passages of Scripture where it says the saints were crying out under the altar for revenge and for God to, to, to step in and overthrow evil. 
And these I are many of the saints who were killed during the horrible times of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a common question. Well, how can they enjoy heaven when they know what's going on on earth? Now, we don't know they're going to know everything that's going on. But remember this intermediate phase, where we go right now if we die, is sort of a staging area. Yeah. Uh, we're in heaven. Our, our, our pain is gone. We don't have our resurrected bodies. We have some sort of a, of a body that, that, that is recognizable, uh, but it's not the final place. And time is different in heaven, you know? It's compressed. It's not the same linear way we have here. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about this. Yeah. Last question, and then we'll go we had, right down here. Okay. The question was, is we're going to receive resurrected bodies. Does it make any difference the way our bodies are processed, uh, cremation, things like that on the earth? Good question. It is. It is. You want I, me to answer or you want to answer? I, I would, I, well, I'll just say no. I don't know. I mean, that's the, my, yeah. From what I've seen in Scripture, God's going to recreate from sure. ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It'll be recreated again, sure. just as Adam was formed from the, the dust of the ground. Whether, and whether you are burned in an accident or whether you, are, you just rot away and become dust, you get a new body. Mm -hmm. Just as the earth, the existing earth, will, will pretty much burn up in that final conflagration and then be resurrected anew. Uh, so it, 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 most believe that while well, some churches teach differently there is nothing in scripture that says if a, if a person is cremated that at the end of 200 years that person is in any different state in heaven than somebody who, who just died and rotted away you, you follow me? ashes and ashes hey we could go on all night are, are, you, gonna, are you excited about this class? Um, do us a favor send us an email um, you can find us on the website woodsidebible.org Take, do a slash internet, woodsidebible.org slash internet, and there's a link on there where you can download the slides and the facts that we just showed you tonight. But um, Andy and I are delighted to, to be with you. We've been wanting to teach this class for a long time, and we're really encouraged to see you. Do us a favor, invite somebody back next week. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all. Have a great night. God bless you.